very, very good. It always seems so lonely and empty when I get up here when all these folks are gone. I'm going to ask Charlotte Lewis if she'd come up and join me. I'm too lonely here by myself. Charlotte's one of our most faithful people. We're so thankful for her. And this is kind of an anniversary for Charlotte, and I want her to tell you about it. I've always been taught all my life that you're, you're supposed to share good news. And um, I'm very fortunate to be a member of First Baptist. All of you love me. All of you have supported me the seven years I've been here. And I just wanted to share with you what today is. Today is a very special day in my life. Um, 20 years ago, um, in October, I was diagnosed with acute lymphocytic leuke leukemia. Um, at that time, when I was nine, I didn't quite know what to think. Um, I was like, okay, Lord, what are you doing? Um, because a year ago, um, a year, I was nine whenever I was diagnosed. I had just become a Christian whenever I was eight. And I didn't quite understand what God had in mind. But um, through the prayers of many faithful people and through the doctors and nurses at St. Jude in Memphis and through the grace and the glory of the good Lord above, I really and truly do believe I'm here today. And today marks... I've been in remission for 20 years as of today. 20 years ago, November the 14th, 1973, I, was, I went into remission, and I have been that way. I've never relapsed. Thank you, Lord. And um, come this December, on December the 10th, I will have been declared cured for 10 years. And I just want to give God all the honor and the glory and the praise for that because I know he's the reason that I'm here. We're thankful for that, Charlotte. And we're so, so glad. You've just shown something we've been preaching lately, and that is that we have a stewardship of testimony. Uh, today we're talking about a stewardship of talents, an objective. Has, has this done anything as far as your approach to life and how you use the opportunities that God has given you? Yes, sir, it has. The first thing I learned, and um, I truly believe this, is that it was through the power of prayer of God's faithful people that I'm still here. I was very fortunate. My dad's a Baptist minister, and, the, and our church family loved us through that experience. I had people in North Carolina praying for me, people in Mississippi, people in Tennessee, all throughout the United States. And I really and truly believe it was through the power of prayer that, that helped bring us through that. That's why I'm so supportive of the prayer groups that are going on now here at First Baptist, and I have one going on, on in my home on Monday nights with my Sunday school class. Also, the, the other thing I learned through this experience is I've learned how the ministry of cards, um, sending cards to people, um, I really and truly believe that's a gift God has given me. And I know whenever I was in the hospital and I was sick and going through chemotherapy and all the different things when I was a child, I remember what the cards meant to me whenever they were sent to me. And I have, recent, I have found through the years that I've been able to do the same thing for people. And just a word of encouragement. And it's amazing how God can place it on my heart to send a card to somebody whenever I have no idea, but I know it's God working through me to um, help brighten their day or help um, them through a tough time. And those are the two things that I've learned the most from from this situation. Okay, well, thank you, Charlotte, and we're grateful for this testimony. Thank you very much, and it took some courage to do that, and we thank you very, very much. God bless you. Would you get your Bibles, please, and turn to Acts. In just a minute, I'll tell you where in Acts. Acts 26, 19. Acts 26, 19. The Apostle Paul is on trial for his life. It's kind of a trumped-up trial. It's more of a politically motivated thing than anything else. But the, he's on trial for the hideous crime of sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he turns his trial into a worship service. He turns the fact that his life is on trial as an opportunity to give a testimony, just like Charlotte just did, of what God had done in his life and what he meant to him. You find the preceding verses, the, the thing that we tell you about so much. Uh, Paul said before King Agrippa, he said, look, I, I was walking down this road and something happened, and that something was someone, and his name was Jesus, and he changed my life, and he said to me to do some things. He said, I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. He said, that's what Christ told me to do. And then in verse 19, so then King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven. I think if there's one thing I could pray for you, and, and I'm thankful for tonight. I'm, I want to share what Larry has said and agree with that. 
it's exciting to see you here. But there's a real sense in which I think that, you know, we're seeing the people who really wanted to be here tonight, and that's a good thing. And what I'd like to say is to people like that, to those who understand that this is the place to be, and our Lord is the one we worship and we love and serve him, I think you're kind of the church within the church if you're, if you're here tonight. You know, they, they filter the caffeine out of coffee beans with water filtering sometimes. I think we filtered our congregation tonight with water. And what's happened and what's here is very, very good because you're the people that I think will see this when others would not. And that is the thing that, that I would want for you more than anything else is a vision. I wish that your life were driven by something like the Apostle Paul. Maybe not driven, but drawn. Just, just drawn toward a goal. Drawn toward a purpose. If I could pray for all of you, I would pray that you would get up every morning knowing this is the reason I live. This is the objective of my life. This is the thing that God has given me to do. I want us to talk about an objective, a clearly defined purpose of living. Isn't this what drove the apostle? He said, I, I had this vision all those years ago. This thing happened to me on that road, and God gave me this vision of what he wanted me to do. And he said, King, here it is all these years later, all the scars, the shipwrecks, the imprisonment, the problems all these years later, and I stand on trial before you today, King Agrippa, because I have not been disobedient to my vision. And this man who was used of God to make a great impact on his world, who wrote half the New Testament, who was the world's greatest missionary, who founded God's church all over this world and still is quoted today, was that kind of person because he had an objective. He knew every morning why he got up. He knew every day what he was about. He said, this is why I live. This is my clearly stated understanding of why I exist in this world today. I, I'd like for all of us to have that kind of understanding of why we live, that kind of objective. Listen to Paul talk about his ambition. He's writing the Romans in chapter 15 and verse 20. It has always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known so that I would not be building on someone else's foundation. Here the man had an ambition. Ambition is a good thing when it's aimed in the right direction. Ambition is right and good and powerful when it's a good ambition. And here's a man who had an objective. Objective is not the same thing as a goal. We can have a lot of goals in life. Objective is to say, this is why I live and this is what I'm about. What would it do for you? Let's think about what would it do in your life if you, like Paul, could say, this is my objective. This is why I live. What would that mean in how you live in this world? First of all, let me suggest it would relieve frustration, wouldn't it? You'd be able to say, does this fit my objective or does it not? All the time I'm asked to do things. I'm asked to do these kind of things and these kind of things, and I can say to people, that doesn't fit my objective. That doesn't fit into what I'm about. I'm sorry, it's a good thing, it's a nice thing to be about, but it's, but it's not a thing that fits my objective. It relieves a lot of frustration. You know, there are people in this world, three kinds of people, some of you have heard me say this, uh, there are people who, who make things happen, there are people who watch things happen, and others who don't understand what's happening. And it's a terrible thing to be in that last two categories. When you just watch things happen, and when you're not real sure you even understand what's happening, then life gets terribly frustrating. Those who make things happen are those who say, I have this objective. I have this goal. I have this aim in life. This is why I live. To, to have an objective means you'll, you'll, re, you'll be relieved from frustration, and it will increase your motivation, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it increase your motivation, your zest for living if you had an objective? If you could write down in one sentence, this is what I am about, this is why I live, then every morning you can get up saying, I know what I'm about. I've heard these motivational speakers say there's two ways that people get up in the morning. Some people get up saying, good morning, Lord, and others get up saying, good Lord, morning. Well, that's true. If you have this objective, then it can increase your motivation. It can give you a reason to press forward. The apostle said in another place in, in Philippians 3, he said, I press 
hard the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He knew what the goal was, the mark was. He knew what the high calling was. He knew what it was about. So he said, I can aim toward that. I'm motivated to go toward that thing. And if you have an objective in life, a clearly stated objective, and you can say, this is why I live. It will relieve frustration in your life, and it will provide motivation in your life, and it will allow concentration in your life. The apostle in Philippians 3, I think it's verse 14, said, or verse 13, said, this one thing I do. He never said, these many things I dabble in. He said, this one thing thing I do. There's power in that. There is power in that. You can diffuse light and just kind of spread it out and it's not very powerful, but you can focus light and make it a laser beam that will cut a human being in two in a second. You can diffuse steam and, it, and it's, it's harmless. It's just fog and smoke, but you can focus the power of steam and it will drive a powerful locomotive. Focus your light. If your life is focused, it will give you power. It will allow the kind of concentration that you need to be able to be powerful in this life. Well, why should you be one who seeks an objective? Why should you take the time to say, this is who I am, this is what I'm about, this is why I live, this is why I get up every morning? Because it'll do some things for you. It will eliminate frustration. It will provide motivation. It will focus your life and make you powerful. And if you want to make a difference in your world, find an objective for your life. Say, this is where I'm going. This is what I'm about. This is who I am. Well, how do you do that? How do you find that kind of objective? How can you say, I can write down in one sentence or maybe a paragraph what my life is about and why I live? How do you do that? Well, the first thing is to spend some time with God. In Psalm, verse 46, 10, it says, Be still and know that I am God. You're going to have to slow down and stop and get alone and spend some time with God, and be still with Him, and listen to Him. If you're going to get God's vision, you're going to have to turn off the television. Paul in Galatians 1 talks about when he met Christ on the road he did something immediately he said he went into Arabia into what he called a, a, a desert now when the Bible says desert it doesn't mean sand and camels it means just unpopulated areas he went off by himself to some retreat place and stayed there three years three years he stayed there, he studied, he prayed. The first chapter of Galatians said he spent three years before God working out his purpose in life. I can honestly say to you that I have reduced my goal in life, my reason to live, to one sentence. It took me in the time that I gave it, and it wasn't concentrated like Paul's, but it, it took me more than 10 years to be able to put something down to say this is why I live. This is why I get up every morning. This is what my life is about. And having done that, it has changed everything. It has changed everything. But it's something worth doing. But you have to stop and be still and be with the Lord. And that's hard to do in our society. And I, I, in World War II, there really, there really was. This, this happened. There was a transmission from a plane in, in the, over the, oh, the Pacific. The pilot was saying, I don't know where I'm going, but I'm making record time. And isn't it true that when people get confused about where they're going, they double their speed? And God is saying, I want you to slow down and stop. And get before me and ask yourself, where am I going? If I get there, where am I going to be? You need to take that time and to do that thing. Would you look now, please, to Romans chapter 12 and verse 6. Romans 12 in verse 6, because this is going to be the first thing we'll talk about in how to find and define the objective in our lives, to say this is why I live and this is what I'm about. The first thing you need to do is identify your gifts. Identify your gifts. In verse 
6 of Romans 12. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. And he said we're to use this in proportion to our faith. And so the first thing is you seek an objective in life to say this is why I exist, this is why I live. Ask yourself, what are my gifts? What can I do? God made you. He made you like you are. He gifted you to be like you are. So probably his purpose for you is in relation to how he made you. So ask yourself, first of all, what can I do? What do I like to do? What, what thing would I really love to do with my life? What am I good at? What can I, can I do? I think the one thing that God wants you to discover is yourself. The one thing God wants you to be is you. I don't think someday when you stand before God, he's going to say, why weren't you more like Moses? Or why weren't you more like Billy Graham? Or why weren't you more like anyone else? I think God is going to say, why weren't you more like you? I made you. One out of five billion people. I made you different. I made you the way you are. And I want you to discover who you are and be who you are. Why weren't you more like you? So discover your gifts. Spend the time to think about, to pray about, to cogitate the fact that you are made in a special way and you're made with special gifts and God can use you as you identify your gifts and then renew your experiences. In Romans 8, 28, it's probably one of the most well-known verses in all the Bible, for all things work together for good to those who love the Lord, to those who are the called according to his purpose. And in, that, in those scriptures, I wish you could mentally underline all things according to his purpose. God has a purpose in all of our life. God has a purpose in all of our experiences. As you seek your objective in life, and, and let me say, I should have said before, this is not just for young people. This is not just for young people at all. This is for folks of all age. If you have never done this, it needs to be done. And especially, I think, those of us who are looking toward, I hope not too soon for me, but looking forward to retirement. We, we read, it'd be terrible to go into retirement without an objective, without saying, this is my reason to get up each morning. This is my reason to live. This is my, my thing to do. All of us need that, but we need it at all ages. This is not just something for young people to do. If you don't do it then, then you miss it. Uh, this is for every one of us, and we need to identify our gifts. We need to review our experiences and realize that all things work together for good to those who are called according to his purposes. You've seen, it, you've seen that tonight. Charlotte was using a part of her experience to glorify God. She really has a purpose in her life because of an experience she's had that was not a good experience. And it was not a good thing. You can't say that was a good thing, but you can say that has worked together for good for someone to use according to his purpose. So review your experiences. It will probably be some difficult thing in your life which would give you open doors to ministry. It will probably be some tragic thing that may have happened to you that will enable you to have a purpose and an objective you wouldn't have had without it. Maybe something has happened to you good or something bad or whatever. God says, I can make this a part of your experience, and because it is, then this can be a part of your objective. You realize how very tender a counselor is who's been through the problem with himself that he's counseling others about? Do you realize how much an alcoholic can have an influence with other alcoholics, someone who's been say from alcohol can, can have a, a witness with others who are struggling with this most tragic thing in our society right now. He can help them more than anyone else could. Someone who's been through this acute leukemia can minister to those who are hurting with that more than any other. I have a friend named Bruce McKeever over in Dallas, and Bruce has had all kinds of surgeries and all kinds of, of uh, difficulties in life, and he... Uh, he had open heart surgery. One of the first people, well, he is the first person I ever knew to have open heart surgery. And Bruce is, is crippled and, and couldn't, couldn't take the treadmill test. And so they, they found this very, very late. And yet he, he had the surgery and he came through it. Uh, he, he did well and he was kind of, he's a pastor of a church he was in Dallas. And, and he'd gotten to the point where he was preaching uh, one service on Sunday and that's all he could do. It was just all the strength he had. 
Well, one of our young men in our church in Dallas said his father was to have open heart surgery. He called me, he said, my father's not a Christian. And he's having this open heart surgery tomorrow. He's having bypass surgery. And we really thought that was very, very serious back in those days. If it were going to happen to me tomorrow, I'd think it was very serious today, to tell you the truth. But we thought it was very, very serious back in those days. And, uh, and this, this man's son was very concerned about it. I went in to see the man, and I scared that man to death. I mean, I shook him up. He thought preachers came when it was the very last thing. I mean, I think he thought I was there to administer last rites. He, he didn't have anything to do with preachers. He never talked to preachers very much. When I came and told him who I was, I could see the panic in his eyes, and I had to get out of there for his sake. I really had to get out of there. So I called my friend Bruce McKeever, and he answered the phone, and he sounded so weak that I felt sorry I'd called him, but I had to give him a reason for having called. And I said, Bruce, if you can't do this, I sure understand, but there's a man up here who's about to have the same surgery that you just got home from, that he's really panicked and he's not a Christian and this guy is really hurting and, and Bruce said well I'll come down there and when I saw him I was really sorry I had called him Bruce came walking out of that hall just looking like death warmed over I mean he was so tired and he was white and he was just weak and and he went in that room and after a while he came out and he was standing up straight he was smiling he said man I, I told him what's going to be like so we got to be friends said he's accepted Jesus as his savior and he's not afraid of his surgery anymore and he said I feel so good about this visit and he went down to the nurse's desk said do you have anyone out here who's about to have open heart surgery and from and he's been doing that ever since he's been having a wonderful ministry uh, your objective can be a part of that kind of thing I I have a friend named Russell Pogue in West Texas who was pastor of a little country church, and he had the unfortunate incident of driving down a residential area one day and have a little child run out in front of him, and he ran over that child and killed it. He couldn't help it. He didn't even see the child. And it was a tragic thing for him to handle. Well, this same thing happened to one of our members in the rural church where I, where I was pastor. We're 40 miles from where Russell lived. And I was there visiting with this lady. It was a coach's wife, and I was trying to comfort her, and Russell came in. And, and he told her exactly how she was feeling. And he told her what she was experiencing. And he told her what would help her. And he said things that, that I would never have said because I had never been through it. And this man, ever since then, every time he hears of someone facing that kind of tragic accident in their life, he goes to wherever they are and has a ministry that no one else can have. I wish you would think about that. I wish you would think about the fact that there may be in your experience some way that you can find a part of your life's objective that someone can do that no one else could do except someone who'd been through it. And I, I do wish that you would think about that and follow up on that. So you ask your question, yourself the question, when you're alone with God, you're spending the time, you're looking for your objective, you ask yourself, what, what can I do? What are my gifts? What am I able to do? What is my experience? What's happened in my life that God could use to the glory of himself and to others? And then ask yourself, what's really important? What is really important? I think if there's one sin we all commit, it's the sin of giving first-rate loyalties to third-rate causes. We don't have time to do everything. Life is a matter of priority and selection. And you ask yourself, what is really important? What really is vitally important in this world? Need to eliminate the non-essentials? Someone said that the best thing to do in life, the best thing to do with our lives is to do something that outlives our lives. What, what outlives our lives? What, what in this world is going to last? Well, there are two things that I can find that are going to last. One is the Word of God. The only two things that are not going to burn up in judgment in all this world, the only two things that are not going to be destroyed by the fire of judgment, according to 2 Peter, is the Word of God. The Bible says that my Word will abide forever, that my Word will always be here. And people, people will live forever, either in heaven or in hell. So I would think that you and I would want to do what we would do in relation to the Word of God and to people. And as we seek our objectives, as we find out what's really important for us to do, those objectives would have to be involving the Word of God and people. Now, there's no way I could tell you what God wants you to do. 
But I can simply say that I pray that you'll have the wonderful experience that some of us have had, and that is to take the time to try to do this, to ask God, help me want what you want, and to be able to say, this is why I get up in the morning. This is why I live. This is what it's about. And I think that when you find that, it'll have to do with the Word of God and with people. In Acts chapter 13 and verse 36, the apostle is preaching a sermon, and one line in it, he says, David served God, served God's purpose in his generation, and he died. It's kind of a gruesome sounding thing for you to say this is this is my climax and this is what my my sermon is about david served god's purpose in his generation and he died it's a wonderful statement david in the time god gave him in his generation he served god's purpose and then he died he went to heaven to be with god heaven's a lot better place than this it's a good place to go i i wish that that could be said of all of us that we serve god's purpose in our generation. Our generation needs that so very, very badly. So let me ask you, please, now to bow your heads, and if you would, to say, Lord, I really do want to know your purpose for my life. I really do want your objective for my life. Now, that may not be career change. It may not be location change. It may not be a lot of those things. But God can give you a wonderful objective for your life. When I think about how God has blessed the people that I admire so very much, the, the people on this staff, as I think about everything they do, I realize that they're people who have an objective. And God has blessed them because of that objective. And they're following that. I want you to have that strength, too. To be free of the frustration, running off in 20 different directions each time, trying to be everything everybody wants you to be. But you can say, no, this is my purpose. And this is what I live for. I want you to be filled with that kind of motivation that says, I've got a great reason to get up and go every day. I want you to be filled with the power of concentration. To say, I aim my life in this direction. And when it's aimed like that specifically, it becomes very, very powerful. Lord, I pray that you'll give all of us the objective that you'd have us to have. I pray, Lord, that you'll speak to us in the context of your word, in the context of your love for all humanity and help us to find the thing for which you made us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we want to invite any who may be here tonight who would make public decision. Maybe you'd want to come and profess your faith publicly in Jesus Christ. Maybe you'd like to join this church and we'd love to have you. We'd really love to have you as a part of this fellowship. Whatever our Lord would have you to do in public commitment, we would ask you to do that. I pray that all of us are asking God for the sanctified common sense, for the purpose that can make our lives powerful for him and for the sake of others around us. A much greater purpose than the mundane, a much greater purpose than this world understands sometimes, but that which makes our lives count for him. We're going to stand now and sing, and you come and do God's word, God's will, would you please?